You're listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get to this week's guest, who is actually a Medal of Honor recipient, we bring another one onto the show. Super excited for you to hear his story. We'll get to that in just a moment. But just a few reminders as we give you the usual homework we do every single week. Follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground at Hazard Ground Podcast. Don't forget about our promotion with Amazon. Go to our website, hazardground.com. You can click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or under the Sponsors tab. Get to do all your normal Amazon shopping. We get a percentage of what you guys spend, and then we donate a percentage back to some of the great charities and organizations you've heard featured here on the show. Reminder, it also works right from your smartphone. If you go to hazardground.com on your smartphone, it'll redirect you to the Amazon app. So all your credit card information is saved really easy and convenient. And with the holidays coming up, and you're going to get a jump on that holiday shopping. Make sure you go to hazardground.com first and do all of your Amazon clicking friend shopping from there. Also, Apple Podcast Reviews, please keep them coming. We're growing up the charts of the Apple Podcast. We want to make sure that we crack the top 100, but we need more reviews, more likes, more stars there as well. So please leave us a short review. Tell us why you love the show. We'll post it on our social media account and certainly our way of saying thanks to you for helping grow the Hazard Ground community. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel or download the Kill Cliff TV app. As you know, Kill Cliff, a partner with us here at the Hazard Ground. Uh, get the Kill Cliff TV app. Don't forget to go to kill, killcliff.com as well and check out all of the Kill Cliff CBD, best tasting CBD drinks in the world. You got flavors like Orange Kush, Mango Tango, Strawberry Days, the grapest of all time, and Joe Rogan's spicy pineapple called the Flaming Joe. Remember, Kill Cliff, founded by a Navy SEAL for those who aren't Navy SEALs. Biggest no-brainer drink in the world. Go to killcliff.com and continue to support our partners at Kill Cliff. Now let's welcome in our guest for this week's show. He spent six and a half years in the United States Army, left as a staff sergeant, and was awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions in Fallujah in 2004. Here to tell his own story is David Bellavia on the Hazard Ground. David, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. Uh, super excited to tell your story. Obviously, you know, it's not often we've had a couple of Medal of Honor recipients on the show, but it, it's always great to just have one um, that that is, you know, uh, such a, a common name in the war on terror. And certainly your story is amazing to read and amazing to see, but we always love hearing the firsthand accounts from it. So that said, uh, as I told you before we started recording, we'll start off with a Let's Go Buffalo for a, for a, for a Bills fan. We don't want to leave that part out. All my Bills fans, friends out there will be very happy that I did not uh, did not disappoint with a let's go. Buffalo. I not you know what? There is nothing where this place can interview can go but skyrocketing up <laughs> right after that. That is I'll tell you, you want to know what's the, e the, the, the most, you know, uh, the easiest path to, to being a combat veteran, to prepare yourself for the trials and tribulations. <laughs> it's to be, be a, a Buffalo, Buffalo Bills, Bills fan. fan. <laughs> Absolutely. If you can endure that, there's nothing that Al Qaeda, ISIS can throw uh, at you. Man, We're uh, ready. We're ready for the I end mean, times. In, in your case, you know, nobody circles the wagons like the Buffalo Bills and nobody runs through the streets of Fallujah like Buffalo Bills fans. So there is well, that. <laughs> No one's had to circle the wagons like the Buffalo Bills. That's, the goal is to not have to circle the wagons. By the I know. Way, but. And again, I hate to bring up the stinger, but, you know, I mean, again, as a Giants fan, you know, that was like the greatest Super Bowl ever. I know you guys were on the wrong side of it. And Scott Norwood can't ever get a chicken wing anywhere in Buffalo. But that said, you know, um, it was a great game. Like as a kid, I, I it's one of the first Super Bowls I remember. It was a great game. Otis Anderson to this day. I mean, that yeah. guy was a stud. But uh, yeah, I mean, these are we're, we're pulling scabs now. And uh, there's no new reason to go back. But but no, the truth is that the Giants, you know, we're, we're so proud to be the only real team in New York State. In New York, exactly. Um, yeah, because everyone is out in Jersey. But uh, we're, we're doing well, finally. And, yes. But, you know, Haley's Comet, once every 76 years, we'll take it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's how it works. So, All right. Uh, more football coming up later. But growing up as a kid in Buffalo, uh, you had snow, buffalo wings, and not much else. So how did you end up in the Army? My granddad uh, still with me. He's 101 years of age. Wow. Uh, Normandy vet, Silver Star, Bronze Star recipient. 
Um, he was uh, just everything to me growing up. And he would tell me stories at the age that he probably shouldn't be telling, you know, a six-year-old about uh, <laughs> the way the screaming memes came in and glider crashes and everything else. But there was just this sense of uh, romance with, you know, serving with, with strangers that you didn't know anything about and that all you shared was your, your nationality. And uh, everyone was different. Everyone was diverse. Um, some were rich, some were poor, some were black, some were white. Uh, but we, we, they fought together. And I just thought that was the most beautiful thing. I thought it was the most noble and uh, honorable profession there was to do. So as the youngest of four, my dad was a dentist. Um, this is before 9-11. Uh, this is something that uh, I needed to prove myself that I could I could carry on my family tradition. And uh, and so I was I, I made that choice to uh, to join the infantry in the U.S. Army. Now, again, I also signed up prior to 9-11 and for New Yorkers, 9-11, it always will ring a little bit different, even though it's upstate versus down in Manhattan. It's it, it's, it's it was always personal. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. But I, I did read that you once described yourself as the weakest link. You know, I, I so when I was home from college, um, the, I, we had a home invasion. Uh, these two crackheads broke into uh, my parents' home. And um, I just, I, the way I handled it was, um, you know, I, I was 22 and uh, I grabbed a Remington 870. And all I thought about was, you know, you could kill someone with this thing if you aim it at them. You know what I mean? Like, you, right. you sure you, this is what you... You know, are you going to be the guy who who meets people for the rest of his life and they tell the story of the two guys you shot in the face in front of your mom and dad? And um, I, I just I blanked. I, I couldn't um, I couldn't really I remember the look on my dad's face that day was enough to really show me that, you know, I needed to mature. I needed to understand what a man is supposed to be and, and a 22 a year old strong you know, kid is supposed to be able to protect his family, protect the things he loves and believes in. And I love my country and I believe in my country. And this is the decision that every healthy American boy and girl should make. Serve your country. America needs us. And, you know, at that time, Kosovo was the big fight. There was no uh, yeah. there was no global war on terror, but it was it was what I thought the easiest path for me to grow and mature. And uh, I needed that and I found it. And Fort Benning, the, the degree I got at the University of Fort Benning at Georgia was the, uh, the, the best education I ever received in my life. Now, I'm just curious, because you had went to college, you never thought about going the officer route? Oh, I did. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I just didn't want to. Uh, you know, my whole thing is if I was going to do the Army, I was going to do it on my terms. And, sure. you know, the, the, there's this thing with college uh, that you could go to specialist Everyone told me that that was a horrible idea, that no one really respected the E-4s that joined the Army as E-4s. And no one respects I got all, either. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, but my old thing was is that I, I wanted to be I wanted to be like my, my grandfather. I wanted right. to be a NCO. Being an NCO in the infantry was the greatest. I mean, to know that I, I would be able to, to lead men. I never thought it was going to be at a time of war, but I, I just thought that was the greatest honor in the world. It said, you know, there's nothing in this world I could do that was had the significance of leading men and, and being the example to them. Now, I was older than than these kids. You know, by the time Iraq kicked off, I was, you know, in my late 20s. Um, these kids were all 18 and 19. So it, it was it was like being a surrogate father in a lot of ways. They they were they were like my sons. And I wanted to to be that example. I, I thought that that was the most noble thing I could do. So where were you on 9-11? I was assigned to a recruiting uh, battalion in Buffalo, New York, in the Syracuse recruiting battalion. Um, so my son was born and he was born with some uh, birth defects. They put him at Oshai's Children's Hospital in uh, Buffalo. And so the army really didn't know what to do. Uh, it was a kidney situation. So there aren't a lot of pediatric nephrologists in the army. Uh, so the choice was uh, when 9-11 kicked off, get out of the army or reclassify uh, and change your MOS closer to Walter Reed or Fort Sam Houston. And I, I, I 
I needed option three. So I uh, contacted my branch manager and I said, what's option three? And they said, option three is that you stay an infantryman, but you go on what's called an all others tour, which means you're away from your family for three years, but there's a war going on. So what do you want to do? Uh, and it was a horrible, it was a very difficult decision, but I, I had, it was a war. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm here for the war. I, I joined to serve my country at a time of war and there was a war going on. There's no way in hell I was going to miss that fight. So I, I chose the all others tour. I, I was away from my family for uh, 36 months and it was very, very difficult. Uh, but, um, you know, in retrospect, it was the best decision I've ever made in my life. I, I got to, you know, serve my country and I got to, to, you know, show that I, I had a role to play in this thing. Sure. So when, when is the year time where you make that decision? Is that right after nine 11 or. Yeah. So, so from uh, September. Yeah. So it would have been like uh, September 11th. I, I, uh, everyone came down with orders within like 14 days, right. your duty station, PCS, all that good stuff. And by early October, I had orders to Germany uh, in the first infantry division. And uh, it was, you know, you alone go for, for three years. And, um, you know, I, I was gone by, uh, from October to orders were cut like in November and, and I was gone in January. And so during that three years, you do a Kosovo deployment and OIF one, correct? Yeah. So from, uh, 2000 and uh, yeah, so 2003 to uh, 2004, uh, we we were supposed to do six months in Kosovo, um, and basically the, our plan was that we were uh, U.S. Army Europe first ID stationed in uh, Vilsic, Germany. We were going to do the invasion from Turkey. That was the you know the plan. Uh, negotiations failed with the Turkish government, so we weren't needed to go in. They took the 173rd, put them in northern Iraq put us on standby. So by the time uh, January, February of 04 kicked off, we got the tail end of OIF one and OIF two. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was uh, basically training, you know, doing your patrols and there wasn't really a threat in Kosovo. It was a, you know, peacetime K4 Bravo NATO mission, yeah. but you know, you're training, you're, you're patrolling and you're training for combat at the same time. So honestly, as hellish, I, I would rather have an apartment in Fallujah than, than do another day in Kosovo. It was the worst deployment, but, but I can tell you, honest to God, had it not been for the Kosovo deployment, had it not been for the nine months of Kosovo, there's no way our unit is as lethal on the battlefield. Uh, we had such an advantage of not only having as many bullets to fire as we wanted, we owned the ranges. We lived on the ranges. We were able to, uh, you know, train with a civilian population in tow. So it wasn't strange for us to be able to treat people with dignity and respect that didn't speak our language or our culture because we were doing all these things in concert. It was like, you know, living at the National Training Center yeah, and doing that for nine straight months and then deploying for, you know, a year plus. So it, it, it was an absolute blessing and our leadership showed up big time and we were ready for the fight. Let me ask you, before you take that decision on the three-year tour, did you talk to your grandfather? Absolutely. Going to combat? What was that conversation? Oh, I, oh he was incredible. I mean, he, he, he wanted to make sure that, you know, we, that I didn't understand the Pollyanna nature of, of what, what I was getting into. Uh, at the same time, you know, you could tell, I could tell he was super proud, you know, that, that, that's something that, that I wanted to do and that I did idolize him and, I do love him. And so, you know, it, it was, um, he just, you know, he was, he wanted to make sure that, um, that I was ready to lead. I, I don't think he would have been as concerned if I was an enlisted guy. I think it's, I think it's much more difficult to follow in combat than it is to lead in combat. You know, yeah. the, the faith that you have to have in your, in your leadership, um, you know, you, you're, the, the type of training that we were getting ready for was a close quarter battle, but it wasn't at all. I mean, you know, when you think about 30, 50 meters, you know, I don't, I don't think, uh, you know, people to all the time, they, they hear the story and they're like, you know, what kind of a shot are you? Are you like a marksman? Are you a sniper? 
I'm like, listen, buddy, everyone's Annie Oakley at two feet. I mean, you know, you don't got to, you don't got a zero at two feet. I mean, if you're missing shots, two meters, then you need lens crafters. Thankfully, There's a major, the enemy of the Arabs would still miss from two feet. You know? Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to be, you know, without precision on a point target from, you know, proximity. So, I mean, what, what I was more uh, worried, what I was more concerned about on a daily basis was the psychological impact of the close quarter battle. Like it, it wasn't so much of, can we do the job? We know what our trigger finger can do. We know what our selector switch thumb can do. We know how to shoot. We know how to drop targets. Are we ready to sustain, uh, you know, the, the type of fight that is eye contact and, and the psychological effect of dropping a target and essentially now, you know, the march up to Baghdad was a 70 mile an hour drive by shooting. You know, you didn't own the, the casualties. You didn't you have to carry them off the battlefield. In this circumstance, it was like, you know, you're there's no one coming. There's no QRF. It's, it's you out there on the Iranian border and, you know, handle your business, do your thing and just be mentally tough enough to endure and luckily, those nine months with the soldiers that I had, we were we were ready. I was super blessed to have just amazing right. soldiers. So from the romanticism you had about combat from your grandfather as a kid to the conversation that he had with you prior to going to Iraq through your experiences, um, has that romanticism changed for you? You know, I love my granddad to death, but I, I think uh, I think we beat him on his stories. Um, you know what I mean? I mean, honestly, it, it, there was a, there was so many soldiers in world war II, uh, not taking anything away from that generation. They're incredible. And they're amazing. The hedgerows are really tough. You know, the end of, you know, people think Normandy was just the beach landing and that was it. There was a, about 30, you know, nine days of sustained combat in those hedgerows pushing the Germans through on uh, how difficult that fighting was. But for the most part, when you have, the advantage of just being able to call in wave after wave after wave. Uh, the tactics aren't nearly as important in a, you know, maneuver enemy versus a, a attrition type of fight. Uh, you can maneuver, you can, you can swing the barn door, you can envelop, you can do all that great stuff. But if you know that you have, you know, the, the, the cavalry is always on the other side, come and come and come and, and it's how many troops can you mass and how much firepower can you put down? It's a totally different fight when, you know, you're, you're in a position where you know that help is there, but what kind of help is it going to be? And at the end of the day, the enemy is going to neutralize your technology by trying to fight in built up areas, right? The, the laser guided bomb, the thermal imaging, none of that means anything. In the history of architecture, I got a corner fed door, I got a center fed door. That's it. That's the only way to enter a building. So if I put a machine gun behind it, I don't care if you're X-Men, if you're SEAL Team 6, I'm going to shoot you in the face with a machine gun. That's the way it's set up. So it comes down to the OK Corral, proving what every enemy of the United States has thought that we're entitled, that we're not going to fight in the pillboxes in Japan. We're not going to go island hopping. The Germans gambled wrong with our fight in Europe. The Vietnamese gambled wrong with our boys in Vietnam. The Chinese communists thought we couldn't fight in Korea. The Gulf War, they gambled wrong with an open sandbox in Saddam. Every enemy of the United States believes that we are not going to take the fight and get up close and personal and, and steal your lunch. And so this, this is all psychological and it's all leadership based. And as great as our generals were, as great as our brigade and, and battalion and command and lieutenants were, this is going to be an NCO one war. It's going to be an NCO one fight. And it's going to mean that you have to lead from the front. You're always being watched. And if you are going to ask men and women to kick down doors and get in someone's face, and you're going to burn them with a muzzle flash, your rifle, you got to be doing that shoulder to shoulder, because if you lose any bit of fidelity in a, in a fight like that, you guys are done. And um, so, yeah, hearing it, it was fun to see the World War II veteran hear your stories and be like, uh -oh. <laughs> you know, like that was, you guys got some action, didn't you? Yeah, yeah that was that was cool. Um, it's interesting to note, I mean. You still got the passion of an infantryman, man. I mean, it hasn't left you at all. There are a lot of people we talk to both, you know, who have 
uh, high level awards and decorations, you know, after a couple of years, the, the, the knife isn't as sharp, but it seems it's the, the, the tip of the spear is still in you, brother. Brother, let me tell you something. The biggest disappointment in the world, and this has happened to a couple of the guys after me, some of those SF boys and the Ranger guys. The Army comes to you and they're like, listen, we want to do this award differently and we want to bring you back in the Army. And I, my heart just filled with like, I'm ready. Yeah, I'm in my 40s, but man, I can just let me, I'll pull the sled, whatever the hell the PT test is. I got to, you know, tackle a dummy, whatever <laughs> I got to do. I'm ready to go. Let me, let me, let me go. And then what do they do? They, they bring you in for recruiting and rah-rah stories. And it's just heartbreaking to know, you know, someone once told me that post-traumatic stress is the reality that you're never going to be cool again. And, and I think the reality of the, the veteran is this is it. This, it's ne you're never going to have a sense of meaning and purpose again in your life like you did in that small window of your life. And you just spend the rest of your life trying to get back to that sense of purpose, that sense of, you know, what is my role in this world? You know, we got COVID and people asking who's essential. I didn't need a member of Congress to tell me I was essential when I was wearing a flag on my shoulder. I knew I was essential. I knew I was needed. I knew that my guys were needed in those positions. And when you are divorced from that, when you move on from that, it's really tough. It's a challenge to kind of find your purpose again. And, and when you're asked and almost teased, I need you back in the fight. I mean, I was doing you know, closed arm pull up. I was just, I'm like, I'm ready. I will. China's got 20 million. I can do many, many barrel changes. I'm ready for whatever they got. Send me to Afghanistan, wherever I got to go. I want to serve. I want to fight. And knowing that that's over uh, was really, really tough. It, it's a difficult thing to be like, you know, no, that's not your role anymore. Uh, we've got younger, better, smarter, tougher guys than you. It's, it's, but it's a part of, I think, who we are. I think we live with it every day. It keeps us going. All right. Uh, back to sort of the uh, chronology of events here. You get to Iraq in February of 2004, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you're headed to Diyala. Um, and what is your mission at this point in time? What are you told when you get on ground? Yeah, Diyala Province is on the Iranian border. Um, everything was great in Diyala Province. Now, there was the 4th Infantry Division was there. That's who we replaced. Ironically, it's uh, a 2 weight infantry, which is the same unit that the 1st ID replaced in Normandy, on the beaches of Normandy. So they called the forward operating base Normandy. Uh, and I would argue that like the Battle of Normandy, the 1st ID was needed to carry the fight. But that's neither here nor there. Um, but no, the, uh, the fourth idea, great guys, uh, super strong, super tough. Uh, they were there and they had been displaced all over Iraq. So by the time they got to Normandy, that was at the end of their rotation. Uh, there hadn't been a whole, there was a, an area in, in that region of Bakuba and Muktadaya that's called the breadbasket. Mm -hmm. It gets a lot of attention around uh, during the surge around 2007 to 2008, where we were in Iraq. About two kilometers to our east is where Zarqawi meets the business end of Arathion Jadam. So, so it's an area that we know that there's an intrusion of a Republican Revolutionary Guard from Iran. We know that Al-Qaeda and the Sunnis are able to hide. You know, when you think of Iraq, you think of desert, you think of arid wilderness. This is an area that's much more akin to Vietnam. Heavy, heavy vegetation, yep. uh, very thick vegetation. It, it increases. The, it's like having a German shepherd taped to your face every day, like the breathing. It's super humid. It's super rough. And because of that, the enemy exploited that. And it's, it's hard to pick up people on thermals and whatnot. So when we get to the Diala province, the enemy hasn't seen a lot of Americans. And for the first month, month and a half, you know, this is, they love us. We're liberators. Everything's great. Abu Ghraib kicks off and everything changes overnight. And you have the, the Easter uprising, the Shia uprising. And because of our proximity to Iran, we went from being the backwater to the war to literally, you know, a platoon, platoon size plus element, two platoons in charge of 285,000 people in the city of Muqtadaya that were fighting, you know, 300, 350 sustained enemy 
Uh, and because of our Bradley fighting vehicle, which is, you know, a, a 25 millimeter Bushmaster cannon with the ability to carry seven to nine infantrymen, we built a reputation of being able to take that armored vehicle into the urban fight. And so when we have success in Diala province, we get picked up to move to Najaf. We get picked up to move to Mosul. And eventually uh, our elements of, of our task force are picked by the Marines to fight with them in uh, Fallujah. So, so we became kind of like the 9-11 of, you know, who do you call when there's a problem? Bring the mechanized infantry guys in to support you for a sustained urban fight. That's what the 1st Infantry Division kind of built the reputation in 2004 to do. And, you know, when the uh, insurgency kicked off, we were just Johnny on the spot. Yeah. And 2004, again, there, there was a strange lull after the initial invasion because, you know, Baghdad topples rather quickly, all things considered, in a matter of, what, eight to ten weeks it was. And then we just kind of hung around. Uh, nobody knew what to do. Nobody knew where to go. And, and the fighting sort of stopped. Um, until you get into, you know, beginning part of 2004 again, where I guess generally most, you know, I, Iraqis were pissed. We were just kind of still hanging around and it, the, the insurgency had time to reform and recalibrate as Al Qaeda in Iraq at the time. And so um, when you guys first get there on a day to day basis, as you're going through this deployment, what is sort of the operational tempo like and how often are you seeing contact? Yeah, see, that, that was the thing that shocked me the most. The one thing I wasn't really, you know, you think about these stories of wars, you think, you know, Denang, that it's going to be, you know, 45 right. days of artillery and contact. And so I was amazed at, you know, the period of time between what they would call serious incident reports, uh, how, you know, you, you, we, so we had regular contact, but it wasn't sustained contact. It wasn't, you know, there, there were big fights and big set plays. But then it, it became the whack-a-mole strategy where, you know, two or three guys would probe you, you would engage them, you would destroy them. There was an IED, there was, you know, a mortar hit, a rocket hit, everything else. But the, the thing that became so frustrating outside of those pitch battles that became few and farther between, between 04 and going into OIF2 was that, you know, the enemy learned the lesson that if they sustain a force and they decide to go head to head with the United States military, it's going to end horribly. So, you know, they wanted those fights to be insurgent, asymmetrical hits here and there and, and move out. And so the frustration of not being able to sustain contact was, was really tough on, on, on our, on our mental ability to figure out, you know, what is the enemy disposition? Are we winning or losing? We know we're fighting a lot of foreigners. We know we're fighting a lot of Iranians, but, you know, killing two or three of them isn't really doing it for us. We're losing men. We're losing people. We want to pile them up. And so Fallujah, Najaf, Fallujah, Mosul for our Charlie company, it, it was a blessing. I was so blessed to be able to have a fight that as a generational fight, we knew you weren't leaving until the battle was done. If there was two to 4,000 bad guys in the city and they were locked down, you're going to be able to avenge every guy you lost, every person that you wouldn't have to deal with the hope and the prayer that I might meet 20 bad guys out there that got my buddy. I knew for a fact that every person in that city was a bad guy and everyone had blood on their hands and the ability to avenge the fallen was such a gift. And I, and I didn't want to lose or, or take advantage of that gift because they were really few and far between during that year in Iraq. Yeah. Um, again, I got there in 05 and it was, it was different. You know, you're doing paperwork for every round you fired. Um, oh yeah. It was a, it was a different world by the time, you know, eight, two years after the initial invasion. So um, as you start to go through the beginning of that deployment um, again, and, and I kind of just go back to this because you, you speak of the sort of romanticism of combat, but reality of combat is a lot different is, was there like that seminal moment early on in the deployment where it was like, Oh shit. Like, you know, um, I might, I might've bit off more than I can chew here. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's the gestation of, of, you know, I, we were fortunate to have a crescendo of, of violence that was pretty sustainable. I, I think if you just take a unit fresh, you know, off of, you know, they're in country for two days, you throw them into a major battle, you're going to have, you know, issues that are really tough to be able to go over, but because, you know, we had the, the ambushes, the sustained firefights, 
the ability to enter and clear buildings and take down targets, you know, in a small group in, environment, the lessons that we're learning um, about firepower, there's no drywall in the Middle East, everything is concrete. So guess what, if you're engaging with a 556, five, that thing is going to tic-tac-toe all over the room. You know, a grenade is fantastic. The Pentagon gods gave us an M67. But if you throw a grenade in a room without ventilation, that's a smoke grenade. And that room is out of, of you know, you're not going to be able to see anything in that room for a period of three hours. So before you start throwing grenades in a concrete structure without ventilation, you better be aware that the enemy knows where your door is and you don't know anything about that room. And you're now fighting in a pitch smoke filled house that you did on your own, you know, accord. So all these lessons we're learning and, it, and it's like controlled failure. You know, you, the mistakes that you make aren't, you know, just debilitating. You're learning lessons and the crescendo of the violence allows you to get ready and say, OK, you know what? We're not doing a good job of we're not supporting our Bradleys. The dismounts aren't doing a good enough job. You know, sometimes we leave our support by fire base. You know, we want to travel with our support by fire base. We want to bring those Bradleys and flex them in. We want to provide security for them. And when we take contact from a building that I don't care if Lucifer himself is in that building, we are going to pile on and go in that room and clear every single thing out of that. And we're not afraid to engage. We're not afraid uh, for that sustained, you know, up close violence. And, and, and that was a gift to be able to have Fallujah at the end. If Fallujah, uh, if Fallujah was in the beginning of the deployment, it probably ends completely different, but because it was at the end, uh, it, it aff afforded us the ability to have lessons learned and and be able to to you know fight better. Prior to Fallujah, how many casualties were you sustaining? We took thirty seven uh, before Fallujah, so oh. it was KIA's or just WIA KIA both. Those are that was the uh, brigade combat team's uh, KIA. The, uh, the majority of our, I think my squad. In, in third platoon, Alpha Company 2-2, I think my squad was the only squad that didn't have, like second squad had almost 100% um, direct fire uh, casualties. Uh, our, our, and we're, again, it was a blessing. The IED fight really hadn't evolved the way it became for you in, in OIF2 in 2005. We weren't really, we did not know, we didn't have an EFP. We did not have the uh, remote detonated IEDs. Most of them were either platter charge, crush wire, or command detonated from batteries. But all of our casualties were direct fire. Uh, you know, rocket and, uh, you know, RPG and small arms and machine gun. And, and you can think of that and you think, well, you know, why would you? I'd much rather get in a firefight than, you know, in the situation where you just drive out, you get popped and you don't ever see the, the enemy's a ghost. So the sustained that that was still the fight in 2004 and i i really consider ourselves to be to be lucky to to have had that type of fight because we're better trained at that and and we have the ability to kind of push back against that so you know we were blessed to to be able to have that that engagement all right so november rolls around um Obviously, November 10th is the, the, the day, but leading up to that day, what was the level of fighting? Were you seeing an increase? Were you seeing a decrease? Was it quiet? I mean, what it was unbelievable. It, it, the, so, so we get ready for the Battle of Antietam and, uh, you know, everything is going to you're going to walk into the city. It's going to be like the Higgins boat and everything breaks out. And for the first, you know, three hours of the Battle of Fallujah, there's nothing going on the the buildings that we saw on the digital you know uh, uh, overhead there the buildings were gone they were eliminated by the bombs that were dropped and the artillery so you know you memorize these maps and you memorize you know your objectives and every kid is going over these aerial photos and you know when you have a big set play like F fallujah you get access to all the satellites all the cool guy stuff and and our you know waypoints and our objectives are are just rubble so it's like, you know, was this where the school was? Is this where the civic room, you know, what, what are we even looking at here? And, and so the big problem with Fallujah was that, you know, Army, it was a Marine Corps-led effort, and the Army was just there to support and provide support. And because of our engineers and the fact that we were an armor, you know, we had the tanks, we had the Bradleys, and we had our engineers, 
we had the Mick lick, which is like, you know, basically a, 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 a rocket fired lasso of C4 incredible technology with our, our, with our engineers, we were able to blow a breach big enough for our tanks and our Bradleys at this giant rail berm at the North of the city. And the Marines could not breach that railhead. And so because of the failure to get through the breach, the first infantry division punched through the city of Fallujah. And we were basically the only game in town for a period of 72 hours. And, and because of that, we went from the support element there to su provide support for the Marines doing their thing to being the only game in town. And for those three to four days, every knucklehead in that city <laughs> came, came right, right to us. So we, we ended up becoming the, the main entree just because there was no one else that was in the city but us. So how does the day, the morning of November 10th, 2004 start? It starts with a, a really big firefight at a mosque. Um, you know, it was uh, super creepy to have, you know, it, we went from the hunter to the, the folks that were out there on the patrol to hearing, you know, the, the swish swash of uh, windbreaker pants and, and, and folks moving up on your position. Um, we were stacking on buildings and then we'd go and grab a house and grab a couple hours of shut eye. And the insurgents were stacking on our buildings. They entered and cleared a building we were in, you know, just, just taking a couple hours a, a snooze time. Um, so it was just a complete juxtaposition of they know we're out here. They know that there's only the Bradleys and the tanks here to support us. They know that the Marines are coming, but they're not there yet. Uh, and so the enemy is, you know, stalking us. Uh, which made things conducive. You didn't have to travel as far to get to sustained fights. But uh, from the 9th of November to about the, the heaviest day would have been the 12th of November. But on the 10th, it, it was um, a lot of buildings uh, with weapons caches. They had little mark, they would mark buildings. One would be a casualty collection point and there'd be, you know, the morphine, the, the IVs. The, and then the next building would, would be for machine gun ammunition. The next building would be for RPGs. And so they marked all these little buildings for where they had their little depots. And we found a bunch of rockets and, and um, you know, just a crazy amount of, you know, I, I saw like an M79 grenade launcher, an M1 Garand, uh, you know, uh, an FAL, uh, just it was like a, a, a museum of Warsaw and NATO weapon systems that these guys had uh, really, you know, just strange stuff, spiking as much as we can, destroying as much as we can. We get the call that uh, our XO and our company commander uh, have locked in about eight to 10 bad guys in a city block. And uh, my XO uh, at Iwan was smart enough to put tanks on the corners. So these guys aren't going anywhere. We locked them in. And uh, we get down there and basically get the mission. You know, at the time, air support in Fallujah was like going to the DMV. You got a number, right? And the planes are going to drop the bombs when they get to you. When they get around to it, right? When they get around to it. So if you got 15, guess what? you're waiting for a fixed wing bomb. It's not going to happen. And, uh, you know, we weren't, we weren't going to get that bomb. So, you know, our, our options were limited. And, uh, you know, we knew we had eight to 10 bad guys in a little city block of about 10 to 15 buildings. And, you know, we, we tried to be creative and shoot some, you know, high explosive anti-tank rounds through them, which make it a lot easier to clear just to walk through the giant gaping holes. But, you know, people are going to hide and, and they had tunnel networks and systems like that. But uh, the building contained IED was the biggest threat. You know, because, you, you know, you don't have time to check for booby traps and everything else. You're, you're trying to shoot people. So, you know, getting that out of their heads and just kind of focusing them on going after them. And, and honestly, it's the easiest form of soldiering. You know, you don't have to worry about civilians on the battlefield. It's if you're there and, you've, and you're military age, you're dead. Uh, you know, you, it's, it's really not rocket science. Okay, so, uh, and coincidentally enough, I'm sorry, I can't let this go, but your last name, Bellavia, is Italian for beautiful street. That was not a beautiful street uh, that you were on. And no. Anyway, so, no. Uh, that said, um, at what point in time, you know, before everything with you entering that house, at what point in time do you realize you're on the wrong end of things? I don't want to say you lost the initiative because I don't have a full understanding of, of you know, but it, at what point in time did you guys realize that, that, momentum, I guess, for lack of a better term, was shifting to the enemy. 
I don't think uh, that. I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm far too cocky to, to ever admit that. Right. So I, I would never say that we lost momentum or we lost the initiative, but it was apparent that, you know, everyone thinks the number one guy in the stack is the one that gets shot. It's always the second guy, right? Statistically, the second guy entering a building is the one that gets popped because the first guy is a surprise. The second guy gets hit. Um, the hardest part to, to drill into young people's heads was that no matter what happens to your buddy, your job is to kill the bad guy. And, and, you know, you know, people get hurt and people are scared and it's really psychologically debilitating to allow your buddy to, to hurt or allow your buddy to be there without aid. Um, but unless you kill the guy who shot your buddy, you're all going to get shot. And so, you know, getting that out of the head that it's eliminate the threat, dominate the room, dominate, 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 always push forward, no matter what your, and your instincts are all telling you and human nature your legs, everything's great. You know, your heart is rocking and rolling and then your brain gets into it and your brain starts making your legs like concrete. Everything that you thought you were John Wayne, you're going to charge the machine gun nest. This is what you were born to do. You start getting machine guns fired at your face and you're like, I should have gone to dental school. This was a horrible idea. None of this makes sense. You know, what am I doing? And so, so you have to constantly remember that your soldiers are only going to do what you tell them to do. And you have to be the example. You're being watched. If, if they're scared, you can't show that fear. You, you, you become the best Texas Hold'em poker player in the world. You're infallible. You don't, did you know that that guy was behind the wall? Absolutely. I did. And there's two more of them. Really? I don't know. I'm just going to throw whatever I can out at you. But my point is I'm never wrong. I'm, I'm going to be here. If you get popped, I'm going to get popped next to you. And we, as scared as you are, there's a guy on the other side of this building that has just realized who the first infantry division is. And we are going to end his life in a matter of minutes. And our job is to make that as quickly and as devastating as possible. Remind all of his buddies that this was the worst mistake he ever made in his life. And, and just constantly give the Newt Rockney speeches of this ain't nothing. We got more in us. Let's keep going. And then you want your soldiers to see the results. You want them to do the battle damage assessment. There is no random splash of a JDAM. You don't know what the, you know, what happened in that building. Well, I think we got seven. I think we got 10. No, you're going to know what your actions led to. You got 14 people on that city block and we're going to pull them out by their ankles and line them up on this street. And everyone's going to know what American power is all about. You now know that you are the baddest man in the Valley. SEAL Team 6, God bless them. Green Berets and Rangers, the best in the world. But right now on this street, no one is more elite than you, 19-year-old kid who can't get his sideburns even. You are the master of your domain. You are the baddest dude in this valley. And we are going to knock their teeth in. And, and we're going to do it together as a team. And so you, you know that you're losing the initiative. You know that they have the firepower advantage, that they, they're loading you into buildings that are, you know, kerosene, bomb. There's bombs everywhere. These buildings can blow up at any time. Your job is just to focus, 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 eliminate the threat. Don't be, we got this. Everything is good. There are, there's no bad news. There's no cynicism. It's all about domination, taking the enemy out and just keep moving forward. No matter what, just keep moving forward. I'm hearing Rocky music in the background as you're talking. Like that's what kind of. That's, that's what you got to right do. <laughs> I mean, honestly, what else are you going to do? The, the moment you give any negative. The moment you are, 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 you know, professor calculus and you start, why the hell are we even doing this then? I mean, if you have any doubt that this is not going to end in victory, that we're not going to win, then who the hell are you to lead people into a fight? If I'm outnumbered 50 to one, if I'm, I'm numbered 100 to one, I can't change those odds. But one thing I can do is when I get to that 27th dude that I shot in the face, the 28th dude is going to realize Something in the water in New York State, don't mess with these boys from the 1st Infantry Division. These guys are not going to quit until they're out of breath. And that is the only thing you can do when you're outgunned and, and, and you're outnumbered, is just to continue to fight and show these guys that this is the wrong vocation they chose. 
And, and I really believe that, you know, if we're going to get to the other side of a global war on terror, we got to remind the kids of our enemy, there's a whole lot they could be doing with their life than fighting Americans, because it's, it's, it's a really stupid gamble. And that's the only way I know how to lead is just to constantly remind them, this is who you are. I trained you. I selected you. If you weren't any good, I would have fired you. I want you. I need you. And I'm going to tell you what, you don't have anything to worry about. These guys are deathly afraid of you. And let's show them why they need to be afraid of you. Let's go out there and take them. And uh, I just had amazing soldiers that just, they did everything we asked them to do. And they did, you know, two steps above it. And I'm alive because of the way they fought. They kept me alive. I didn't save them. They saved me. They're, they're, they're the best of the best. That's awesome. Um, as you come upon the house uh, where you had to clear, end up clearing it on your own, um, what's going on? I mean, wh what are you seeing and hearing that leads you into this building? So the, the first issue is that my company commander, so, so the day after, I got my Sergeant Major Stephen Falkenberg is the first KIA in the battle. American KIA, that's our sergeant major. We lose Sean Sims and Edward Iwan, the XO and the CO of our company, are killed the very next day. So this block has got, you know, 150 bad guys in it. We happen to have one little neighborhood, one little block of it. But the greater community is surrounded by enemy. And so as this fight breaks off, the company commander has... Uh, a, uh, a building across the way. And because he's the company commander, he's on the radio. All the attention is with the company commander's fight. Uh, a scout that is assigned to us, uh, JC Madison, is killed right outside that house. So they, we've already taken a KIA. We've already taken a casualty. Um, and, you know, the sun comes up and we end up losing more of, of our guys in the same neck of the woods. So we weren't really getting all the attention because it was pretty much just my platoon. And, you know, there was a, there were fights all over the place. And so, you know, we're still looking, we're still trying to find, they're in sustained contact, but we're still looking for these guys. And over time, we're looking, we're looking, we're looking, and we find them. And by the time we found them, you know, everything else had been going on. We didn't, you know, is it a false report? Is it real? By the time we walked into that building and they opened up with, you know, PKM machine guns, we knew we were in that building, how many people were in that building. It was academic at that point, but I mean, it was so dark and there was so much chaos going around that if there were two of them, they had machine guns and they, they knew what they were doing and they had the, you know, they built up a fortress inside this house. So, you know, it was just, you know, let's just take down as many targets as we can and wait for the bomb, wait for the bomb. And when the bomb is ready, We'll, we'll fix these guys in this house. They won't move and we'll just drop a bomb on their head. And that bomb, that bomb never came to that end though. I mean, I guess strategically um, and you know, all the, the, and I'm not discounting the rah-rah stuff because I, I, I do humanly believe like you talk about the attitude in which you approach combat can determine some of the results. Right. Um, so uh, that aside, but I guess strategically, if you're in this whole block and this whole house, was there another option to move to a different building, to work a different area, and then come back to that uh, at a later point in time? Or were you sort of funneled into this one house for a specific reason? Yeah, so, so as we go into the, the building itself, uh, the machine guns uh, open up from an interior room, and then there's two, a machine gun that opens up from the outside of the house. So we've got, you know, PKM fire leaving the kitchen into the courtyard. We've got two machine guns firing into an area and it completely pinned down the entire platoon in the house. Gotcha. At that point, our 240 Bravos outside are firing into the kitchen and that crossfire is deteriorating the wall that we're hiding behind. So you've got, you know, a fuselage of fire coming through an open door. You've got fire coming out of a window and our two machine guns are firing into the house and so this cross section of fire, you couldn't get two feet off the ground and the wall is now crumbling. And so there's rounds just tic-tac-toeing everywhere. It's like throwing a, a giant log on a fire. You just the embers of tracers everywhere. And you don't know what's happening. I, 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 the first thing I'm yelling to my guys is to cease fire. 
because we were doing so much reconnaissance by fire. I thought we just shot. So we got excited. We kept shooting. I wasn't aware that we were being fired at. All I could see was the R762 coming in. And I thought, whoever is shooting, you're going to kill us. Stop. And what my team leader, Knapp, Chuck Knapp, told me, he's like, hey, Sarge, tell the enemy to stop firing. The bad guys are shooting. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't even oh. know what had happened. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, all right. So once you get your bearings after those shots start getting fired, um, what's your assessment? And what do you do next? My my uh, M my M four is uh, disabled. The round hit it right in the uh, in the well. Uh, wow. The uh, magazine is you know the the all the bullets are out. The uh, the coil the spring is out. The round hit the um, the the dust cover, uh, and so the I had a split like a double feed, but it was a it was a seven six two round actually in the breach. I mean the the weapon was was deadline. And, uh, and so I couldn't do anything. And I just kind of, I screamed for a machine gun. I wanted the 240, but there was a saw there. And so I, I basically just slid. I'm the only guy on the other side of the building. Everyone else is on the, the right side. And I realized that, you know, the only real thing I can do here, because of the angle of the door, bowling a grenade, there were Jersey barriers. So it was a stairwell going up and Jersey barriers underneath the stairwell. So it was basically a bunker with overhead cover. And there was so no like, way to like use the angle of the upward steps with a jersey wall right. in front of it to create like a little foxhole, if you will. Exactly. And so okay, there was gotcha. no way to get a grenade in there. I didn't know, you know, I'm not going to walk up and toss a grenade in. I, I figured the best way to do it is just to put a, a machine gun in that hole or at least put fire on them and Australian peel out of the house, get everyone out. And so I, I, I slid my, my, my broken weapon for a, a a drum two four you know 200 rounds of 556 five, and a saw and you know the plan was misa you're my last man you yell last man everyone get the hell out and i'm gonna keep these guys busy uh and and everyone get out and let's re let's come up with a plan of how we're gonna do this bring the bradleys in do something and as soon as that plan came out i you know all right look, we're ready to go everyone's ready to go and I was like, I need some more time. You know what I mean? Like this was not, you know, the, the, the heart was the, 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 the uh, heart was willing. The flesh was weak. Beach. And <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, my, I couldn't move my legs. I just, I, I just felt sweat in areas of my body. I didn't have sweat glands. It was unbelievably, um, I mean, it was it. There's no way I was going to, I mean, you thought you're I, getting killed at that moment, right? There's no, there was absolutely, I, I, I I'm doing my own, BS Newt Rockney speech in my own head and I'm not believing it. You <laughs> know not, what I mean? You're full of shit. I'm not, yeah. I'm like, there's no, come on. And so, so, you know, I don't know if I want to be dramatic. I don't know if I want to say something epic. Do I tell, you know, but I'm not going to give an, you know, an, uh, my own eulogy to my friends because then now they're going to think that this isn't a good idea. I've got to at least be the, the guy. I've got to at least say something and believe it. And so by the time I got in this thing, I, I tried to get myself as low as possible. If they're going to kill me, they're going to do it through the Sunni triangle on my face. You know, I'm going to, my, my helmet's going to be low. My sappy plate is up high. I'm, I'm walking like a chicken so that I can give them a small, a target as possible. If they're going to hit meat, they're going to hit, you know, my kneecap, my arm or my face, but they're not, you know, anything in the chest or the helmet, I'm going to be able to, it, you know, get low and creep up. And as soon as I make that maneuver, I, you know, I put my finger in the trigger well and hook it because if I get hit, I want to just keep that fire going, you know, just keep that machine gun firing. Mm -hmm. And so I hook it to my second knuckle, which no one would ever do with a rifle or a machine gun. And I got my elbows locked in super tight. So I have stability. I got the gangster grip. And I'm just going to slowly truck that machine gun into that hole. And as soon as I do that, I, I, I get a runaway, like not even 20 rounds into this saw. It is just cyclic. I can't stop it. You know, and now down range, you'd break the links off. You point in a safe direction. You know what I mean? You try to end the fire here. I, I want to keep the fire going, 
but I know I'm going to run out of ammo. And now I've got this existential crisis. Are the, was it BS and basic training that I could put a magazine in my saw? Was that just clever marketing <laughs> or does that really work? You know, cause I don't want to all, every time I ever put a magazine in the saw, I jammed like every two rounds. Right. I've never been able to fire 30 rounds out of a, out of a, you know, magazine fed into a saw once the mm-hmm. belt is done. So I'm like, look, man, I've got a limited amount of time. Just keep walking. And as that machine gun got lighter and lighter, it, those 200 rounds went in like a nanosecond. I mean, I, I thought I had time. And I, I'm, I find myself on top of the stairs pointing down and I can see these guys' face and their teeth. And I'm just like, I'm out of ammo and I'm done. Like I have no plan outside of, I was going to shoot these two guys and it was it. I went, we went, that was my plan. And I didn't shoot any of them. My rounds were everywhere and I was out of ammo and I was on top of the stairs. So I was like, um, I don't know what to do. You know, that was pretty much done. So you see these guys, you're out of ammo. Um, what other options do you have? I mean, do you, do you start working away out of the house? You go back up the stairs? How, how does it play out? I had an empty magazine. Uh, I threw the magazine just to give them something to think about, and I got the hell out. I ran <laughs> as, as quick as I possibly could. And I remember as I was running, I noticed how damaged the room was. Like just there was a chandelier above us that was just shards of glass and so it makes everything really slick you know what i mean the the bullets the metal i mean everyone's bleeding we had a guy that got hit under the vest we had guys that were you know literally their eyes were full of glass i mean you're firing machine guns through metal bars and glass i mean everyone's got a gash and and there's no one that's unhurt in a house fight at close quarters but it was just so odd to see that everyone was gone and the confidence i had that at least they stopped shooting was then interrupted by the exact same fire without return fire at me. And so like the debilitating nature of my morale is absolutely the lowest in the world because not only did I not do anything, but now there's no one to at least keep their head down and they're just firing rounds. And I just feel sparks and heat. I feel the physical heat of these rounds just ear and popping and and just impacting the concrete and ricocheting and i'm thinking you know i'm getting out of the courtyard and i'm just i'm moving as fast as my legs can move and as soon as i got through that gate someone grabbed me by the h harness and just pulled me off my feet and behind a wall and it was just like the whole road got peppered you know, right, right where I was. So, I mean, it was, it was like, I thought at least I hurt someone. I killed someone. I got their heads down. And then not only did I not do that, but there were rounds that weren't just coming from that room. There were rounds that were coming from the kitchen. And it felt like there were rounds coming from the, the roof of the building. And I, my head is trying to think there's only two in there. So where, how did these, how are these orbital rounds coming from? Like who's shooting from that elevation? Like what, what where, how did this, was there another window that was opening up as well? And as I'm going through this, all of our guys are returning fire over this wall and these rounds are coming from everywhere in this house and just the windows are blinking and you can just see rounds everywhere. And I'm thinking there's gotta be more than two, three, how many people are in this place, you know? And, and that's, you know, when plan B. Which is what, what do you do next? Well, bring the Bradleys up. The road's too narrow to get the Bradley to traverse at an angle that could actually have some standoff distance because the road was so narrow. The Bradley could only fire at a certain elevation, and that elevation was the brim of the wall. So, you know, when everything in the second and third stories was getting peppered, but it was just a matter of, you know, is that enough to get the bottom floors? Is it enough to do whatever? The 25 millimeter, we want, I, I wanted to hit the courtyard to make sure that these guys couldn't run away. Um, and it was like, okay, let, let's just, let's just go in there. Give me a, a brand new rifle 
I wanted a 40 millimeter. I got a A4, M16 A4 with a 40 millimeter on it. And uh, I figured with a 203, a grenade. Um, I started giving away my magazines, which was probably a really bad idea. But I figured that if I got killed, I didn't really want them to have, you know, five, I mean, I, we carried so many magazines. It was more than 270 rounds. It was, you know, 700 rounds. So I just wanted to not give them enough. So I, I lowered my amount of ammo. And I, my, my thought process was just soften them up. And then when second, when first squad comes in, you know, at that point they had secured another building. They did it all by the book. And uh, I, I was pretty much there. And then I had a reporter with me and this Michael Ware from time magazine has got a camera and he wants to go in the house too. And I, you know, I didn't even, I, I didn't even think that that, you know, I just needed motivation. And the fact that some civilian is going to believe that I could actually do this, you know, I was like, I needed that. I needed someone to believe in me. So uh, I, I took uh, Scott Lawson, uh, Tristan Maxfield, uh, Lance Ole, uh, Chris Ole, and um, Jim Metcalf, and uh, three saw gunners, put them outside the house. I had uh, another staff sergeant with me to provide, you know, security. And I just wanted to see what the situation was and see if I could pick a few off from the window. And by the time I walked in the house, everything had been rearranged by that 25 millimeter. It blew up all the water. It blew up everything. The, the 25 explosive HE was just devastating. So now there's like, you know, about five inches of stagnant, dirty fish smelling sewage water mm. everywhere. And everything that was tough to navigate with my boots you know, sand speckled to now like slimy bacteria water. It was like being on an ice rink. And sure. every time you walked, you were sloshing water. So they could see the wake of the water as you were moving through the house. It was just a matter of time before they knew we were in there. And uh, I saw a guy putting an RPG together. He had the fuse and the rocket and he was going to fire it at what looked like a big stack of propane. And I looked and I saw little blocks of C4 everywhere wired in, in the room and I could smell the gas. And I was just like, you know, we're going to blow up. We're going to die. So let's uh, let's just see what we can do. So do you eliminate that threat with the guy with the RPG? Yeah, he found himself in a really awkward situation because of the the way that that little fighting position was built. He awkwardly had to get the rocket out he didn't i don't know if it was his back blast or what he was trying to protect but i fired a 40 millimeter that missed everyone and went outside and by the time he was positioned in his spot he was really awkward and and so you know he couldn't really move so he was just absorbing rounds and he kind of crumpled right there i shot the other guy in the back who was kind of moving his way across and uh i had a, a bathroom a, a bedroom to my back and I hadn't cleared it. So I just kind of moved in there to quick do a scan. And when I turned back into that room, the one body was there, but the other guy was gone. And you just saw like a, put a wake of water moving. And I'm like, you know, did he run away? Did someone grab him? I mean, what, what was it? You know, like he was right there and now he's not right there. Uh, and then I just start hearing just a cacophony of foot traffic upstairs people yelling in Arabic, people moving around, sloshing through the water. And I'm like, there is more than two people here, you know? So I, I just found a little cove of the, of the room and just focused on that door and anything coming through that door, I, I was going to pop it. Did, um, did you have accountability of the rest of your squad at this point in time? Do you even know where they are? I, I knew the guys were outside. Um, I had a radio in my ear and I was really giving away my position. So I kind of got rid of that. Um, but uh, I, I, everyone in the platoon was in another house and they were trying to get an elevated position. I mean, they were doing it the right way, which is to get a higher position and fire down on that house and then come up with a plan. I just wasn't aware that the house was 300 meters away. They were setting up the machine guns to basically fire into the house because the Bradley couldn't, fire into the house and i just didn't give them enough time to set that plan up um but i knew that the entire platoon was in another building and i took the guys that i could take 
uh, we probably could have communicated better. Right. All right. So at this point in time, you're facing the two guys underneath the stairs with the PKM, right? That right. threat is over. The guy with the RPG um, who was outside trying to shoot inside where you were, that threat is over. What's next? You you said you mentioned that you went back into a bedroom, right? Yeah, so I'm in the bedroom. Uh, the, the second wounded guy is not dead yet. He comes through, uh, engage him at the doorway. Um, he crawls into the kitchen and basically succumbs. Uh, then a guy comes down the stairs, and as he does that, there's a little gap between the metal and the concrete of the frame. I have a PQ2 Alpha, uh, which is, you know, infrared laser. Uh, with the night vision and that, you know, I put that right through that little gap and I'm enough to wing him and well, then and put again, more so rounds. You, 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 night vision, because it's dark in the room that you're in, correct? Is that well, why you night, night vision? It's a, yeah, it's a double-edged sword though, because you need a little bit of light. You know, right. the loom was so dark, but the, the laser was enough to illuminate, you know, the floodlight was enough to help. The problem with that night vision though, as you know, is that any movement on your head, it shuts the, the night vision off, right? So it's made for the airborne troop and everyone else not to, you know, if you have a, a problem and a sudden movement, the night vision turns off. And because I'm, you know, moving around and it, it's falling off the, the tie down, it's off the, you know, it's not, so, so it's not conducive or helping, but also, um, the only time the night vision was of effect was that shot with the PQ2 Alpha. And after that, it was just a matter of trying to, you know, and you're thinking to yourself, is that a wounded guy? Is that the same guy? Is this a new guy? You know, it's so dark. Am I just, am I just fighting the two guys that are just keep coming back? And as I'm, I'm doing all this around comes flying horizontally in the room I'm in. And I'm thinking, you know, my zero is off or I'm, I juiced around, you know, because I was nervous or something. And, and, uh, I look at this wardrobe and I could see a giant hole in it. Um, and it just explodes with wood and rounds come out and the entire wardrobe opens up and a guy basically runs out of the wardrobe. And that's, you know, of all the things I was expecting, that was, you know, not in the top 10. Yeah, it's like a horror movie. You're like, you know, is this what I think it is? And then it just pop. And, and and I'm telling you, man, the wardrobe landed on its doors, right? So any other way that that wardrobe lands, it lands flat. I'm standing behind it and I get shot. The wardrobe landed on its doors. And so it, it had a weird angle to it. And that weird angle was enough. He put his AK like under his armpit and ran so that he was firing from behind as he was running forward. And those rounds just hit the wardrobe. I mean, like the luck of that is like, unreal. you know, any, any position that wardrobe was in, I, I had no cover. And he hits the mattress. And when he hits the mattress, he just goes ass over tea kettle. And he rolls into this door. <laughs> and, and as he rolls into the door, I put, I mean, the, the report is, you know, it's one thing that, have this all on videotape, you know, your memory versus what's on videotape. I thought I shot him 10 times, maybe three or four, but I, I just remember, I thought I put a magazine, a half a magazine in this guy, but I definitely hit him. He had a bandolier. Um, and, uh, I, I hit him repeatedly. And, uh, as I'm going to change magazines out, I look up and, and he's gone. He's not even there anymore. And it's like in the movies, you shoot a dude and they're just there. They're done. They're dead. The mm -hmm. five, five, six, it just like pisses them off. Like, unless you're hitting bone, that five, five, six just goes right through him. And, um, he, he got up and, and ran up the stairs. And, uh, I saw, I saw him, I saw he was wounded. Um, and I liked my chances. So I just kept going and I could see the blood up the stairs. And it was a lot of blood. And I okay, figured. So I'm just sorry to interrupt. I'm just wondering, after what you have faced on the ground floor, there wasn't a moment of hesitancy and you heard people upstairs. Why would you go up there by yourself? Like, it'd be one thing if you had two or three guys with you. Why would you go up there by yourself? I'm just kind of curious. Did you ever give that a moment thought? I honestly, in my own head, I got two downstairs and this is the third. 
I, it, it, it did not dawn on me that there would have been more than five people in the house until I got to the second story of the house. <laughs> and that's, that's what, no, honestly, I, 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 I thought, because I know the story, like, I, you know, I'm laughing. I, 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 I thought in my head that this is the third guy and I shot him repeatedly. I mean, there's no way this guy has any fight to it. I mean, if you took four to five at that time, I thought I hit him 10 times, but I hit him four times in the chest. I could see his, his wife beater t-shirt He's bleeding He's hurt. He's in excruciating pain. And there is a small dog amount of blood all the way up the stairs. And this guy's leaking out. I, I'm like, I mean, I'm fine. Right. I got to finish the job. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, there's no way that I'm going to lose this fight with him. I, I can't. Right. And as soon as I get to the top of the stairs, my slick boots in the water hits the blood. And I, I kind of lose my footing. And he was right at the landing and he just, he just right where my head was, he, he fired around and it, it just totally changed the trajectory of everything. Not only did he have the presence of mind to, to not run all the way up, but he was waiting. He had the presence of mind to fire around. He obviously wasn't as wounded as I thought he was. And now I'm thinking about how horrible this entire idea is, but I'm on the landing of the stairs. So now I'm like, okay, do I stop? Do I go downstairs? What if I go downstairs and Lawson shoots me? What if the saw gunners shoot me? What if my squad is coming? To, maybe I just need to stay right where I'm at and just kind of, you know, hunker down and make sure that I don't get hit by friendly fire. But, you know, I, I just decided at least peek in the room, you know, see where he is and how he's doing. And I have a grenade. And so I use my grenade. And figure, well, if I'm not going to, you know, if I don't have to engage him, I might as well just frag out. And um, that's what I did. I fragged that room out. And so that eliminates that guy. No, it, the, the grenade hit him in the head and it rolled. <laughs> the, 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 the room was like an L-shaped room and there was a bunch of mattresses. So when the grenade hit him, he kind of like threw it and it just kind of blew up in the mattresses. But it just created like this weird oil fire like these mattresses over there aren't are like the worst type of foam yeah like things you put over a mattress um but but they're cheaply made and, and when they burn they just like this black oily smoke pours out and this room had on this story had a door that opened up to a porch and the porch on the second story had ventilation so the smoke was just flowing out the door and it just, the whole room just filled. And, uh, you know, I, I, again, I, he was, you know, in writhing in pain and he was making noise. And as he's making that noise, I hear another person above us on the roof of the third story that is shouting back at us. And so, uh, you know, my instincts at that point was just to be, find this guy in the smoke hit him with the rifle, just beat him to the point where he, you know, just, you know, I pacify him any way I can. Um, so at this point, are you thinking this guy's never going to die? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the smoke really freaked me out because um, I just, I, I knew my guys were coming. I could hear throughout the, the whole, there's a battle going on. It's all over the city. There's gunfire and bombs and everything going off. But I could hear people downstairs screaming. I could hear people outside. I could hear the Bradleys rolling. I, could, I, can, I knew that they were trying to find me. And my biggest fear was, I know that my guys can shoot and I don't want to be shot by my own guys. So yeah. I, I don't want to be in a position where these, you know, a, a swarm of infantrymen come in and just start blasting everything. Uh, and so maybe I have to, and then, you know, I'm also knowing that I ordered a bomb, you know, and, and, and so now it, are, are they going to drop the bomb while I'm in there? It, you know what I mean? So like all of these irrational, rational fears are just kind of popping through your head, but you know, it didn't feel like it was, a half hour. It didn't feel like it was closer to 40 minutes. It felt like it was like two seconds. And sure. 
you know, it, it just, there's a lot of things going through your head, but my, my, my thought process at that point was, you know, all right, this is the last guy, no matter what is on that roof. If there's a squad plus on that roof, I'm done here. Let's just end this and hunker down and wait. And as soon as I kind of move my way through the smoke, I just get a tremendous sense of natural gas. I mean, the most powerful natural gas smell, propane. I don't know anything about propane. Is it, is it going to just blow up? Is it, you know, leaking? There's an open flame. Uh, is that going to cause the entire building to blow? Like, I have no idea. But there's just propane everywhere in this room. And I can smell it. Uh, I shot one round in that room and then i was just like i hit a tank and i was like I, if i shoot again the, the the room is gonna blow up uh and i can't see so i'm using my rifle to basically find them but also to fan the you know the smoke and whatnot and you know i finally made contact and that's really where the story becomes you know the the, the version that everyone loves to to talk about but it was completely you know accidental and you know, certainly if I was going to devise how that was going to end, it wouldn't have ended that way. Okay. So uh, you make your way onto the roof after this. Yeah. So that guy, uh, we, we kind of wrestle and, and he gets killed. And at that point I'm, my helmet's off and my IBA is open and I don't have positive control over my weapon system. Uh, and I just kind of get out onto the porch to get air. I, my eyes are burning. Um, you know, I got bit. I got, you know, it was kind of a, I got so it was hit. A hand, that was a hand-to-hand -hand deal with him? Yeah, 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 yeah. And and it was, you know, using my helmet, my sappy plate, um, and eventually a Gerber. And, and so it was just kind of like I needed air. I needed to get something. And when I walked outside, you know, my, my first instinct was just kind of hug the wall. I don't have a helmet on now. My IBA is open. I'm exhausted. Uh, and I'm having a hard time breathing, to be honest with you. And so I'm kind of hugging the wall and just realizing I'm just going to stay right here. No one, I can't get shot. I, you know, if they come in, I could just kind of wait for the shooting to stop, but nothing could hit me from the sides. And I'm safe in this little corner of the porch. And I do what all infantrymen have been trained to do, which is tactically smoke a cigarette. And uh, I just kind of pulled out a, a Marlboro and just kind of cut my hands. And, you know, just I needed I, I was whether it's a panic attack, I don't know, you know, whatever it was, just I needed something to just kind of chill me out mm -hmm. and light discipline be damned. Um, I'm just going to get a couple drags off a cigarette and just kind of stay in this corner. And wait for this whole thing to kind of end. I mean, when you and say it's, the whole thing to kind of end, I mean, you, you're assuming at this point in time you're not going to make it out alive. Is that generally where you are mentally? No, I, I'm I'm pretty confident I'm going to make it out alive at this point. I just I just know how lucky I am, and I know that there's more people in this house. And so my whole thing is, if I can just stay on this roof in this corner, Fitzy and the guys are coming. And at that point, I'm outside. I can hear all of the feet. I can hear all of the people and everyone screaming and communicating and I don't want to give away my position. They think I'm dead. They think I'm alive. You know, at that point, none of that matters. I let the squads flow in. They're going to shoot everyone up. They're going to come upstairs. And no matter what happens at that point, you know, I'm, I'm in an area where I can't be hit by a door. I can't be hit by anything. And I'm just in a safe little corner surrounded by concrete. Nothing can, can hurt me. Except, of course, I realized that there's a person over my head <laughs> and he jumps down. And when he jumped from the roof to that porch, you know, it was just, it was like, again, you, I just never expected that to happen. But the, the way he landed, it was obvious that he either broke his leg or something horrific happened, catastrophically happened to his leg. And, um, you don't have a weapon with you at this point, right? No, I don't have my, my so my rifle is in that room uh, by right. the door. And, but his AK dropped. 
And so immediately his AK slides, it had rained that area. The porch was pretty slick from the, the rain uh, and his kind of AK like sp spun out um, and the magazine was uh, out. And so I just slapped it in and, you know, again, it was already on fire. I uh, rolled the bolt back, uh, popped around and, and just squeezed it. it. He'd obviously been firing that weapon and there wasn't a full magazine in there. Uh, and I didn't hit him um, at, at all. I it just was like a, it's an AK. I'm not accustomed to a, an AK without a butt stock. It just kind of went, you know, around, but it was enough to freeze him. And uh, when I walked into that room, I kicked my rifle. And so I just picked my rifle up and threw a fresh one in. And he, at that point, was like hovering between a water tank and like this, his, his leg that was, you know, messed up was kind of the stuck and he couldn't like lift it. And uh, I just kind of hit him in the thigh. Um, couple times i don't know but he uh that you know that was the resistance that was holding him there and so when he fell down he fell right in front of the saw gunners and the saw gunners just kind of opened up on him and uh, we never recovered him because he you know he fell kind of in a palm area um but i assume that he didn't make it at this point do you think the house is clear. No, I, I, I thought that there was probably, you know, with this, with this luck, there was had to be another five or six guys in there. I didn't want to, you know, my, my theory was just to kind of stay put, you know, what, what happens Lawson comes running up the stairs and screaming if I'm okay. And as soon as he does it at the top of the stairs, he turned and one of my, my first squad leader uh, Fitz, he shot Lawson with a shotgun. Huh. So just to show you, like my, I was a hundred percent correct that that could happen. Lawson got hit with buckshot in his chest on a, in a sappy plate because of the fact that he ran up the stairs. It was like Bellavia, Bellavia, where are you? And I'm like, dude, they're in the house. And as soon as he turned, he got hit with, with a shotgun round. So it was, um, <laughs> that was what I was worried about. Is he okay? You know? He was fine. He caught a couple of the, of the balls, um, nicked his neck and shoulder. Uh, nothing, you know, nothing wow. to be, but I mean, I'm sure that's, great, that's a great story in the platoon after the fact. Oh, no. It was, it's <laughs> it like, what are you doing? Everyone's popping out everywhere. Everyone's jumping around. There, there's another guy in that house that's basically locked himself in a closet. Uh, and he's, you know, basically locked himself in this little metal closet uh, in that, on that floor. Uh, the guys put their rifles in there and, and take him out. Um, whether that was Misa Lawson or Fitz, I'm not really sure, but the other guys did that. Um, so there were other people in the house, but you know, my, I was just kind of, I didn't move from that porch for, I was going to say, is there like a sense of I'm not walking back down through this fun house again? It's almost. Yeah, like no, I, I, did, I swear if, 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 if they gave me the choice, I would have just I would have just slept there because I, I was just like, you know, what's coming next? What's happening? And then they tell me we're here because a bomb's about to drop. Uh, and so they we run out. A fast mover comes in, drops a bomb. It's a dud. Goes right through the house and doesn't blow up. Oh, God. A second fast mover comes in that thing doesn't go off and we're look, and we could hear it like doom, 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 like bouncing and um we kind of looked at each other and thought you know 25 plus 500 and then like we're gonna drop a 2500 pound bomb and i'm thinking like okay so 25 plus 500 plus 25 we're literally you know right outside the building and uh, we're loading everyone up in the Bradleys. Fitz and I kind of stay outside. And when that thing went off, the guys in the Bradleys, they got concussed. It was actually the, you know, there was no, that was the worst place they could have been. They were, we were much better off the outside. Go, the pressure, yeah, yeah. We, were, we were much better off outside the Bradleys than those guys were. They're, 
their eyes were just bouncing around. Um, but that explosion was the worst part of the entire night, to be honest with you, because it just like your air gets sucked out of you and it, the concussion hits you before the noise does. And it was like, you know, 5,500 pounds that was, you know, 120 meters away. It was, um, it was nuts. When, and then the day, uh, you know, kept going. When you get back to base, finally, um, you know, how do you put the whole story to get, like, do you get other details from the guys in your squad about what was going on outside while you were inside? I mean, how does, yeah. is there anything else in the story that sort of fills in the holes for you? Well, they're all liars. Uh, that's number one. They all want to take credit. No, no these, these are great guys. It, you don't have any idea of what happened. Um, I'm on videotape saying, you know, how many people are in the house? And I'm like, uh, three, four, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Like, you know, it wasn't a story that I thought it was going to be my bar story. It was going to be my VFW story, but it wasn't going to be, a, you know, a, this, it wasn't going to be something that was going to be, you know, crazy. And, and, um, but, but the real, uh, the real, th so we didn't go back to base. We lived in the city for 27 days and just abandoned houses and whatnot. And, and I just remember the time, you know, Michael Ware is the time magazine guy and he just disappears the next day. And while he disappeared, he wrote the, the story. And so it was now a front page story in Time Magazine. And that's when the story kind of took a life of its own. And, you know, people started just in the army tells their version. You have your version. There's a videotape out there, which is the ultimate narrative. Everyone kind of has their own little version of what went down and what they saw and what they did. And you kind of find it, you know, what the consensus is but my version of events is that i would have told you that that entire thing took two minutes to, to go down and you know it turned out to be like 38 minutes 40 minutes um i would have told you that i hit many more targets than <laughs> than uh <laughs> that i thought i did um i thought i was far more accurate than i was uh i remember there was um you know, the guys went through the objective and they were making sure everyone was was done. And Fitz, you know, carried a, a, a Mossberg. And he shot one of the guys that was, you know, to make sure the guy was down. A lot of these guys played dead. And when they pulled him out, there was a shot pattern at the heart. And one of the, you know, army echelon guys looked, took me aside and said, let me tell you something. In 30 years, I've never seen a shot pattern that tight. <laughs> Uh, you're an incredible shot to be able to hit the heart in that close proximity. And I was like, that's a shotgun. That's not, that's, that's what, a, <laughs> that's what a shotgun does two feet away. No, no, I didn't do that, but thank you very much for the kindness. <laughs> I appreciate it. I, I never, um, I didn't think it was a big deal uh, because we had other fights to go. The 12th of November was actually yeah. much crazier than that. Well, that was my that was my next question. I mean, you know, you talk a lot about PTSD or whatever. Um, there, I would assume that there are other nights that give you more pause and more struggle than than November 10th. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the guys that, you know, go away and uh, the guys you miss and the, 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 the stories yeah. that you think yeah. you. Yeah, no, th you think about those a lot more. Honestly, well, I think about Iraq all the time. I don't I don't I'm not back. Um, I'm not back there. I don't, I don't, um, you know, I don't, uh, it's not something that consumes a whole lot of my, you know, and, and the other thing is that when, you know, they were talking about the medal of honor and they were saying about the medal of honor, I just, it didn't seem like, I didn't think it was, a, I mean, I've been, we're all little, you know, sure. Kind of amateur historians. I didn't really think it was, I mean, I, I would expect, some, I mean, you know, I got lucky is what happened. And, you know, it wasn't a, it was just a luck. You find yourself in a, just keep rolling until you're out of luck. And, um, you know, I, I just kept rolling, but I, I never would have told you. I, honestly, if, you know, if you're going to take your, the craziest firefight you've been in and say, okay, you're going to get a silver star for one of them. Which one are you going to pick? I wouldn't have picked November 10, 2004. Just right. in my own little history. Sure. If I was going to pick one of my guys who I thought did things that were more impressive, 
I'd pick three of my guys and I would say, I can, I can make the argument that that's a Medal of Honor story. And they would be like, well, tell us why. And I would explain to them, I'm the squad leader. I saw the whole battle. I saw the whole thing happen. I know exactly what that kid was thinking. I know exactly what that kid did. And that kid turned the tide of a battle by being a stud. And that saved lives and took more enemy lives. And I think that's worthy of this award. Um, I didn't get that luck. You don't get interviewed for the Medal of Honor. The Army never, they don't care what your story is. Sure. No one's ever sat me down and said, tell us the story. We're going to write it down. They don't believe you. Do you they think, believe everyone else. Do you think that if you hadn't had that reporter with you that you're a Medal of Honor recipient? No, absolutely not. It's uh, without Michael Ware that that story is. Um, and honestly, it was he did a documentary called Only the Dead on HBO. Mm-hmm. And if that documentary is not released, I don't think they look at this award again, because that was the first time anyone had seen that videotape. And and so the, the videotape was pretty much in his sock drawer for, you know, 10 years uh, until that videotape kind of made its rounds. Um you know, that's when I think this thing got kind of a second traction, but I, absolutely not. Without Michael Ware, um, I can't think of a time a videotape has been used for an award. Mm-hmm. I can't think of a time when an embedded reporter, his narrative was no, actually yeah, taken right. into I've never heard of that happening. I mean, the amount of sworn statements that have to go through an award like this are phenomenal. People don't even understand the corroborators. Um, oh, yeah, they don't believe star. anything. Oh, yeah, a, a, absolutely. A, a, you know, a, a, a distinguished service cross, uh, you know, let alone uh, a Medal of Honor. So um, these pa- these Medal of Honor packets look like phone books and they never let you see them. You never you never get to see what people said, the notes they had, the questions they had. They never interview you. They never go into detail. It's really bizarre. The whole process is super secret. And they just call you out of the blue and they never tell you that, you know, you were rejected. You just assume that you were rejected because, you know, you didn't get it for 15 years. But it, the whole it's thing is like it's the Hall of Fame. You know, if the phone rings, they only tell you about it. If the phone doesn't right. ring, you can assume it, it, it didn't happen. Um, so and I don't want to, you know, fast forward too much of the rest of your military career. But, you know, you stay in until 2006 and you decide to get out. Why? I stayed in until 2005. That's Five. when I got out. And, and honestly, there was no. So Paul Ray Smith just received the Medal of Honor posthumously for what happened at the Baghdad International Airport in 2003. And so they didn't have a living nominee. There was no living nominee. Everyone was was deceased. Um, And so the Army didn't have a protocol. And they basically said, we'd love you to re-enlist. I love the Army. Um, I was supposed to get the Distinguished Service Cross for, you know, our that was the award. It's a DSC. And when I went to the award ceremony to get the DSC, they told us that it was upgraded from a DSC. And so we were all like, what is upgraded from a DSC? The DSC is the highest army award. The medal of honor is a, is a branch, you know, DOD award. So, you know, we all kind of looked at each other like, you know, what, what does that even mean? So basically they were like re-enlist, and we're going to take you out of circulation. We don't want to deploy a Medal of Honor recipient or a Medal of Honor nominee. It's not conducive to, um, you know, to you're putting everyone in jeopardy and it's too much of a high profile thing. Um, and I was like, I, I can't be an infantryman anymore. What's the point of doing this? I mean, I've seen my family for three years. I'm going to get divorced. You know, why, why not at least be an infantryman and be a father and, and do all that. Uh, but it, it wasn't something that they didn't ha- Now they have an entire division of people that do nothing but the Medal of Honor and they walk you through everything and they have a whole protocol and a whole you know, way to do everything. Now that then they didn't have any of it and they were just like, you know, you're not really, you're a liability. So just go to Fort Benning, Georgia, go to TRADOC and, and just kind of hang out at basic training. We'll break glass in case we need a war story. And, uh, you could talk to a ranger class graduation. I didn't really want to do that. Um, so I got out. Yeah, that's uh, um, doesn't seem like a sweet offer at that point in time. No, it wasn't. But I didn't really think it was going to, to be honest with you, it, it's like, you know, you think it's going to happen. 
and then it's not going to happen. And then you're like watching, I, you know, I, I got to see Sal Gianta and, you know, all these guys, great human beings, all Afghan vets. And I saw the pressure they were under and, you know, Dakota Myers got TMZ in his life and Kyle yeah. Carpenter, all these people just in your personal life and in your business. And I thought, man, I'm blessed not to ever have this thing. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to have, you know, people in my life, in my business, you know? So I thought that was another blessing. You know, I, I'd, I'd love to be just a normal Iraq war veteran. Um, but I mean, I could think of 25 guys that I would put as a medal of honor recipient above my story. And I, to be the only living recipient, is just, it's almost insulting. It's not even an honor. It's, it's actually, embarrassing to me that we don't have more recipients from the Iraq war. Uh, it doesn't make me feel extra special. It makes me kind of feel a little bit angry. Angry in the sense that we don't do it enough or we haven't worked hard enough to find the stories out there. I that- just don't think we, I think Iraq was the bad war. It was the war of choice, the war based on bad Intel. We had entire administrations that wanted to forget about it. And the more we brought attention to Iraq, the more we had the uncomfortable, awkward conversation. And, and we put the foreign policy above the valor of a generation. And there's so many people, Brian Shantosh, Jeremiah Workman, uh, Christopher uh, Adelsberger, uh, Rafael Peralta. Um, I, can, I mean, that's just the Marines and Fallujah. That's not even, you know, any other theater. There, there's stories all over the place. Um, and it's just, it's not right. And so I, I, you know, do whatever I can to bring attention to men who aren't here to, to have attention brought to them. When do you get the phone call that uh, the award has gone through? Uh, December of 18. Wow. Yeah. It took and it, 14 yeah. years? 14 years. And by the time, listen, when they started calling, yeah. asking me questions about what happened, I, you know, I got a lawyer. I mean, honestly, I was like, you know, what do you want to know about Fallujah? They're talking about autopsies and investigations. I'm like, hey, listen, I don't remember anything. Like, you're going to have to, I'm not going to jail. I mean, all I do is I turn on the news and I see people going to jail for some right. disgruntled soldier said this or said someone got jealous. They didn't like how they were depicted in a book. They thought I was getting rich off a movie. Someone's going to try to throw me under the bus. Like, not a chance in hell. I called a lawyer and said, hey, I'm not, I'm not participating in anything. You tell me what I'm charged with and I'll talk. And they were like, no, it's, that's not what kind of investigation this is. I never in a million years thought it was a metal bar. Well, especially not 14 and, years later. No, you, you just have no concept. And then you pick up the phone one day and it's president Trump. And he's like, Hey, and you're like, what, what the hell's happening here? You know? And uh, yeah. So I got the call and it happened and I was just kind of like, you know, I'll do it. You know, you don't have a choice. You can't say no. You literally can't say no. If so you had a like, choice, would you have said no? Absolutely would have said no. I said no. I, I said, this, I, I got too much going on. I, I had, you know, I had a job. I had a career. I had, you know, I, I was going through a divorce. All of these things that were just really inconvenient. And they were like, this is happening. Like, you know, you, 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 you have an obligation to your country and to your army. And you're a soldier. You know that's so, true. That you have an obligation to accept the award. You I do to the army. Okay. Now, l- looking back now, and talking to so many recipients, I, I, I see this as we're not recipients of the Medal of Honor. We're custodians of it. Carriers. We of really it. are. Mm-hmm. And and I I don't see this as an award about a person. I see this more about and the fact that there are no living recipients from the war itself in Iraq, um, Sergeant. Um, Payne is not technically considered an Iraq recipient because he got it during the ISIS fight and the caliphate. Um, but I mean, he's an Iraq recipient as well. But, you know, looking at that group and thinking to myself, yeah, we do. We have to do more. We have to educate people. We have to remind them of what was sacrificed, what kind of people were out there. And so, you know, let's make this about, you know, the guys that didn't get the glory and didn't get the stories and don't get the, you know, the attention. And that's, that's what it's, what it's about for me at least. Well, uh, shameless plug. That's kind of 
the whole point of this podcast, you know, I mean, right on, not, right every, on. not everybody gets to be American sniper and lone survivor, right? Not That's everybody right. gets to have a book made into a movie, but uh, everybody has a story. And, and our whole goal is to continue to share those stories, whether it's the specialist who did four years, one deployment and got out or a three-star general um, who, you know, was all the way working up at the Pentagon, the highest levels of department of defense, everybody's story. Um, you know, what I always like to say is, there are bigger pieces in the pie, but you can't make the whole pie without every piece of the pie. Amen. And everybody has a piece of the pie who put on a uniform, went to fight for their country. And so their story, uh, you can't complete the whole thing without it. And so that's part of, you know, the sort of mission statement of, of the hazard ground is, is to do that sort of same thing that you're talking about right there. Um, but it's, it, it is heartwarming to hear you say that, you know, I, I think that's super important um, to, to make that distinguishment of, you know, being a Medal of Honor custodian and recipient and, and all that comes with it. Because again, it is, um, there is a, everybody we've talked to, th there is a burden to it. And I, I hate saying that word because it's so negative, right? But there is a, there's a responsibility to being it that um, I think a lot of you, and as you said, don't really ask for the responsibility, don't really want the responsibility, but you have it. And so right. from that standpoint, you have to treat the responsibility with the respect it deserves. Yeah. And, 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 you know, look, uh, if I get a DUI, I know what the first sentence of that story is. Medal you know, of Honor, Medal of Honor guy right. screws up and hijacks a bus full of penguins or whatever. So yeah, you, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta be, um, you know, it's an accountability that you don't necessarily want. Sure. I, I think I was blessed to get it 14, 15 years later, because, you know, I look at some of these younger kids, man, and they're 23 you know, a lot of doors open for you, but there's a lot of temptation out there. There's a lot of crazy out there. Um, yeah. These, these guys, you know, I, I always talk about Sal Genta, the first guy, the first living recipient, but the way he has conducted himself, the way he handles himself, he's just a, a, just a tremendous influence and ambassador of the way you're supposed to be. And all these guys, we're all different. They're all kooky and, and different personalities, but you know, it's, it's like, it's our fraternity now and they're really good and decent men and they serve their country. And I'm curious about the fraternity. Um, when you, when you walk into that room as like the FNG of the fraternity, you know, what's the feeling, you know, I mean, is there like a sense that everyone's staring at me kind of deal or how do you relate to other medal of honor recipients? It, it's different with our generation, right? So, so I'm the, one of the oldest recipients Brit is the oldest uh, Navy SEAL from mm -hmm. uh, Roberts Ridge, but uh, so but of the Army guys, of the non-special operative guys, I'm I'm the oldest of the the group, right? Um, now these guys have had it for ten years and whatnot, but like you know, when I, so my book came out at the time when there weren't a lot of Iraq War books, and so like you know, some of these recipients you know joined the Army because they read House to House and. And they were, you know, kind and respectful, but it was like the Fallujah story, you know, happened in some cases, you know, eight years after these guys even were in the service. So, mm -hmm. you know, those kind of stories and legacies were already built, but the real awkward weirdness is like Hershey Mayamora from Korea, Woody Williams, a flamethrower from Iwo Jima. Yep. You know, Joe Marm and Pat Brady and Gary Bikirk and Gary Luttrell and Roger Donlin, who they based the Green Beret movie off of. You know, these are the guys that you're just like, you're on holy ground talking to. Um, but, you know, you, but some of the other guys that Afghan, they're humble, they're humble, decent folks. And they 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 just are really good guys. Leroy Petrie is, is you know, a dear friend. I love him to death. He's a stud. Uh, you know, uh, Clint Romage and, um, you know, uh, just, they're just, they're really quality stand up. Ryan Pitts, um, Ryan Pitts you know, they're, they're yeah. yeah, no, he's a, he's a, he's a good dude. He's a solid, solid humble, yeah. amazing, heroic, wonderful ambassador of our generation. And, and, uh, I'm, pr I'm proud to know him. I'm proud to be associated with him and, and knowing that he's going to be in my life for the next 60 years is pretty cool. That's awesome. Um, you had uh, mentioned House to House, the book that you wrote, uh, and all this happened before, obviously, 2018 when you were notified. So what was the impetus for the book? Why'd you write it? You know, I uh, I think there was a mindset. There were no real, there, there was no books out. Lone Survivor came out, House to House came out. And, uh, you know, 
he, Marcus <laughs> is a friend. And, but when that book came out, it was just like, you know, no one wants to read about your story unless you're a seal or a sniper. And, and, uh, and, and my story was like, I wanted people to know it's not a memoir. It's a memoir. You know, my story is about like my team and, and how combat is just shitty. Everything about it is horrible. And, yeah. and yet you see the most beautiful aspects of life in combat. And it's such a weird juxtaposition where the worst of humanity brings out the best of humanity. And, yep. and, uh, and, and I was proud of that, but, it did start a cottage industry of war pornography. And looking back, I don't think I would have written house to house knowing what's happened now where you've got, you know, books like destructor, you know, how I murdered 80,000, you know, people with, you know, artillery. And it, it's turned into like a, Oh, you did that. Well, I did this. You know, I can top that kind of story. Yeah, and it, that's just I I feel like I'm a part of that, and I I never wanted to be a part of that. So, um, I'm careful. I'm doing a new book now that's kind of a little bit of an apology for you know just how I want our generation to be remembered. It, it's not about us. It's never been about us. It's about our collective. It's about what we can do and how we're going to come home and change the world as as citizens. You know, our real service starts when we come home, you know, and, and, and what, how we add to the community, how we heal our country, how we lead our country. So, you know, th that's important to me. And, and uh, yeah, by, I look back at it now and it's like, you know, any book that the original title was like an epic memoir of war. And I'm thinking any douchebag that puts epic in their title, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I didn't name that book. There's no way I'd call anything I've done epic an epic memoir of war so the first decision i made was like just call it a soldier's memoir enough's enough with the epic you know this isn't moby dick here we're not old man right. in the sea uh but uh you know it is what it is and um you know i i'm just glad it it all turned out to be true <laughs> you know what i mean because right. when you write a book like that it, you know people are like mm, it's been like 20 years and no one has corroborated the story sir um it, it was it was fascinating that 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 video existed. I mean, that blew me away that the entire thing was on tape and, you know, how how you kind of have to Explain almost go back and tell the video and, and how it came to be like, I mean, who had it with them? My, the reporter was just running tape the entire time. Oh, OK, so it was his, the, his video. Yeah. So he's running tape. He's got the camera on. Uh, and then they, you know, juxtapose that with the drones and everything else. But the, the idea is that he videotaped the entire engagement, you know, like, and, and the idea that, you know, you're writing a book, you don't know there's a videotape, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're the only, really, there's one, three, four witnesses to the entire thing. You could take some, you know, there's a temptation to want to maybe take some liberties. Exaggerate. Yeah. You could be like, I didn't tell you the one guy was seven foot four and <laughs> you know, he, his arms were actually RPGs. He fired them, you know, and you know what I mean? And, and so to he would know, clap and thunder would come from the sky. <laughs> to know that that tape is out there and that, you know, it's accurate is, you know, something that you, you almost are relieved in a sense that, you know, you're not, you don't want to be the guy that, that says, you know, I killed 12 and then, you know, you're not, you're not even in the room. So, so, I mean, but, but it was, I give him a lot of credit because uh, I don't think I, I embedded as a reporter myself and I went back a couple of times to Iraq after my fight and I would not have had the intestinal fortitude to trust a complete stranger and put my life in his hands the way he did. Um, but he's a, he's a really different type of reporter, man. And he's a different type of cat. And uh I give Michael Ware a try. I don't think I'm here without Michael Ware, without a, without a doubt. I, there's no doubt. So you wait, you just said you went back to Iraq? Yeah, I went back in 06 and 08 as an embedded reporter shooting B-roll. That's right. And, okay, so you, yeah. you go back there doing that. I mean, what's that experience like for you? It, it, it just reminds, you know, I remember coming home from the war and just thinking, you know, I was in the line at Starbucks and I always had like 11 guys behind me that could enforce my will. You know, I was an 800 pound gorilla. I was like, oh, you got an attitude? Well, Ruiz, come take care of this. <laughs> when you're alone, you don't, you're just a normal guy. And 
when I was embedded, I didn't have any camaraderie, any fraternity, any support. And, you know, you don't want people to know that you were a soldier. You don't want people to think that you're trying to micromanage, but when you're getting fired up and you know that this is like a horrible plan and it's like some, you know, some LT that doesn't, or some squad leader that's green. And you're like, man, could you just let me, can I just help just two seconds real quick? Like you're under a giant water reservoir. That's a target reference point. Okay. You've selected a giant sombrero where anyone from Baghdad to Fallujah can put you in artillery range. Like don't put your collection point under a target reference point. Like, you know, these are the things you want to tell people, but you, you don't have any say and no one, you have no credibility. They're not your soldiers. It's not your role. You're an observer. And being an observer is really the most powerless position you could be in. And so it, it, it wasn't fun and it wasn't enjoyable and it was more stressful than anything else in the world because you don't have the ability to defend yourself. And then you also are are cognizant of the fact that these skills are perishable. You think that you can go right back and be like, Hey, I know, I didn't know the difference between incoming and outgoing. You know, after two years, you're the new guy, like, Whoa, this is pretty, pretty close comfort here. Those are outgoing 155s there, Professor. You know, you're, you're you you forget <laughs> you forget it. It's a perishable skill set. And if you don't do right. it and work on it, you're you're nothing. You're a Call of Duty kid. Let me um you've mentioned PTSD a couple of times. Um, where are you? I mean, have you ever bothered to get checked out for it? Do you have it? Do you know it? I don't, you know, I, I'm I'm the guy who's um you know, I'm like the uh, 70 year old woman on Facebook when it comes to COVID. I'm uber alert and aware of everything that's <laughs> out there. Uh, I, I go for my tune ups. I go for my checkups. I, yeah. I know that it can manifest at any point. I don't consider it to be a weakness. I don't consider it to be a, 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 a post-traumatic stress syndrome. I think syndrome is outrageous. It's post-traumatic stress. You don't tell the kid who got shot 12 times, he's got multiple gunshot wound syndrome. You don't say that it's post-traumatic stress. So I'm I'm uber alert and aware that it can manifest at any point and that there are triggering things. Afghanistan could trigger people and another war, another attack, casualties, smells. Uh, I want to be healthy. I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. I want to enjoy my family and my friends. I don't want to be a victim of combat. I don't want to be a victim of my circumstance, but, but I'm aware that some people do struggle and, and I want to be there for them as well, but I don't look at it as, um, you know, something that I'm more powerful because I don't have what other people have, or I'm, you know, I'm different in some way. I just feel that if you're on top of it, and you really are talking to people and you're going to therapists and you're talking to folks and you're working on you, you can get, you know, you get through the dark times because you surround yourself with people that are worthy of your time and your space and, and they, they can help you get through it. Would you, uh, would you say to your kids when you told me you're getting the medal of honor? They really didn't know. They haven't read the book. They were pretty young. They didn't really know my time in the military. Um, I just had one son. I ended up with three, uh, two boys and a girl, but they, they, dad was an army guy. Dad was, you know, business guy. Dad was lawnmower man. Dad wasn't, you know, army guy. And so it was weird to have them react to this. Like, who are they talking about? You know, like, who is this? Who is this guy? (laughs) So I'm like, yeah, I don't know either. GI Joe kid. (laughs) It's surreal, but you know, whatever, you know, that's why I tell you to do your homework, you know, but, Wait, but you, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. You, you, you spoke about, you know, the, the lessons your grandfather spoke to you about. Is there a time and day you think you'll speak to your children in the same way about it? No, nah, I don't, I don't want them to, you know, I want them to serve. I want them to absolutely be a part of the army and experience it. But um, no, nah, I don't, I don't, I don't think that, um, I just don't think it's the, there's a, there's a, 
when you go I mean, to you combat, realize the internet is out there right the, the, your kids are going to find this story out listen i'm not afraid of them finding out the story what what okay. i don't want to happen is i think that there's a sam uh, fuller was a filmmaker that served in the korean war and he made steel helmet and big red one and he used to fire a 45 in the air instead of saying action right he was just a lunatic when he made his movies he was a combat vet and he used to say he was famous for saying that combat is an experience where you, at the first time you get shot at, your stomach gets twisted. And for the rest of your life, it never untwists. Yep. And, and I thought, well, you know, there's a, a innocence that we all lost. Every time we deployed, you yes. saw something horrible happen. You never get it back. Why force someone to experience something unless they choose to go down that road? Why, why traumatize someone? and remind them that our experiences can be victimizing. They can be traumatic or they could be empowering. They could be, I went through this and that means I have to be able to get through something else. I have to use this for good. I have to do something for someone else because so many brave, beautiful men and women weren't able to come home. That has to be why we went through it. Otherwise, you know, we serve a sadistic and unloving God. So you know, I, I look at all of it and I think to myself, you know, don't intentionally, there's some people that low crawl to the copy machine. They put their DD-214s on their car. I mean, they're super proud of their service and I get it. But I just found that if they want to know something, they could find it out on their own. But are you going to be the type of, of person that is going to intentionally try to, you know, to use your experiences in a way that, they're just not old enough to understand. If you don't love something, you don't fight because you hate Islam or you hate the enemy or you hate China. You fight because you love your friends and you love yeah. your country and you love our way of life. We fight and we kill because we love. And you know, people tell me all the time, I die for you or I die for this, I die for that. We we're, we're love to use what we die for, but is there anything in this world worthy of killing for? Are you willing to kill for what you love? Because every veteran that's been in harm's way has been willing to kill because they love their culture, their way of life, their country, and their friends. And that's a beautiful thing. And it affects you for the rest of your life. And, you know, there's just some things that aren't necessary to share with, with everyone. No, again, totally fair. And, and, and I've said it a, a hundred times on the show, you know, um, who you are when you go to combat dies the minute you get there and you'll never be that person again, ever. Yeah. Um, yeah. It doesn't matter what happened to you. It doesn't, doesn't matter. You, you, that person is dead. Uh, the world is different. Um, it just, it, it's kind of the price we pay for what we do. Uh, whether in on November 10th or any, any other day for that matter, anything you sort of would do differently in your military career? I never would have gone in that house. That was asinine. <laughs> the whole thing was, no, I, mean, I never would have done that. I, I, I don't regret much, but that was a really stupid idea. And, you know, you do that nine times, you get shot in the face. Nine times. Yeah, no, it, it um, no, I don't think, I don't think we change anything. I, I would have loved to have been more in the moment um, during that time of my life and enjoy people that I thought were going to live forever. And I would have loved to have been able to have, you know, done something different that we could maybe have more guys back here. But um, and I think we all have our regrets and whatnot, but uh, I would love, I would, I would love to be, you know, just a veteran. I don't want to be a professional veteran, never wanted to be a professional veteran, but you know, these things are chosen for us. And, um, but I really loved my life when I wasn't medal of honor guy. I had a great, great life and it was fun and uh, I miss it. I do. <laughs> I miss it. Wow. Um, I was going to ask you if there's the, what's the good part about being a Medal of Honor recipient? American Airlines gives you incredible perks. Um, <laughs> you, you get to go in the lounge. You're an Admiral Club concierge key that's about it really is the uh the flight <laughs> privileges uh, the that, benefit, huh? that's it honestly there's really not i mean you're you know it's um 
it's look, it's an incredible honor. It's an amazing fraternity. We just lost a recipient two days ago from the Korean War. Marine fell on a, a grenade. Uh, Dewey passed away. Um, you know, the, the number is smaller and smaller. And in 20 years, we'll, we'll have 15 recipients, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's a small club, but, you know, we, we, we get a little crazy over awards and we don't really focus on the essence of why we serve and the people out there, the, you know, the, the, the awards are cool and the stories are awesome, but, you know, in order to get the Medal of Honor, you have to have it witnessed. And there's so many things that have been done in our military that were not witnessed and were amazing. And, um, you know, so sometimes, you know, enough's enough. Um, I, I think I kind of know the answer already, but I'll ask it. Where is the medal? I'm sure you don't take it out much. I wear it to Walmart every day. I, I can get no there. It's weird. There comes, there comes an age where people put it on a lot. I, um, I, I don't feel like it's mine. You know what I mean? Like I'll, sure. I'll look at it sometimes and be like, you know, I, when I first got the award, I was in, they, they send you like around the country and I went to New York city and some old Korean war veteran looked at me and said, you know, that's stolen valor. You can't wear that. Yeah. And I was like, I feel the same way. I do. I feel the exact same. I just got this like a day ago, but I agree with you. Mm. It's, it's, um, it's weird. I, I, I look at it and it's like someone else's award and I'm just there to take care of it, keep it clean. But the moments I get to take it off and let people hold it, you're not supposed to let people wear it. I let people wear it all the time. Anyone, you can wear it. You put your medal of honor jail? Well, exactly. <laughs> Who cares? But I mean, I, people need to hold it. I'm telling you, when you hold the medal of honor, it's like the Lord of the Rings. You, you're feeling the Battle of Gettysburg and, and Ia Drang Valley and you know, it's Mogadishu. Oh, it's yeah. it's I mean, it's, it's everything. It's right there. Said, I kind of chose hearing it. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's that, that's. It's a, I've it's never a held, held a medal. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 when you, when you start to bring all that into it, um, you know, it kind of really brings it to life. Um, and why? It and, and, cool. and it also it, it completely humbles you and it makes you completely insignificant. You know, like I'm a well aware that no one wants to meet me. They want to meet the Medal of Honor. I, I, I've even gotten emails. They're like, can the Medal of Honor come to Nebraska? <laughs> like, I will mail it to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Just you send it care. back. It's a pre postage yeah, envelope. <laughs> we're, we're just a bunch of idiots that, that have it. But no, it's really the award. People want to see the award. They want to meet the award. And I'm all about meeting the Medal of Honor and, and letting people realize that we are an amazing country because men and women are willing to give everything. And that's the most beautiful sacrifice in the world is a healthy person that decides I'll be uncomfortable so you can stay comfortable. And uh, I, I'm, that's what that award represents. And that's why, you know, people need to hold it and see it. Well, on that note, um, listen, uh, I, I interviewed several Medal of Honor recipients. Uh, I'm glad I know you beyond the Medal of Honor recipient. I'm glad I got to know David. Uh, I'm glad that you and I have some things in common and that, uh, you know, there's a there's a New York bond between both of us that uh, extends well beyond anything that's worn around our necks or on our chest or anything like that. So getting to know you over the past couple of hours has been an amazing journey and a lot of, uh, to say the least. So I hope one day we share a beer. Uh, I hope one day that we can, uh, you know, connect on a different level. At the football. Super Bowl yeah. with the Buffalo Bills. But listen, I, what, right. what you're doing and the interviews you're doing and the amount of professionalism, how you're representing veterans, we need to be seen in the light that you're presenting us. So you're an outstanding ambassador of all of us. But listen, man, this is important work. Uh, getting those stories out there, letting people know that we're normal, that you can be you should want to be like veterans. We, we should be emulated because we stand for something. Uh, but, but this podcast, I hope it grows, continues to grow in success. And you're amazing at what you do. This was a, I've had a lot of interviews, bro, but you, you're good at this, man. You, uh, there's almost been a couple of Dr. Phil questions. Um, you know, you're really good. And uh, you're only going to get better. So God bless you and keep, uh, keep being a rock star. Oh, thank you. It's a humbling. Uh, very humbled by the comments. I certainly appreciate it. Again, uh, it, it's great getting to know you. Um, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Um, and, and continue um, that custodianship. You know, it, it, it's I think that 
is the one takeaway I have. The the honorable the ownership of that custodian of the medal, I, I think, is something that that you know you can hear. And that, listen, man, I, I love the passion you have as an infantryman. I can still hear it. You know, if, if they let you go pick up a rifle and go back to combat, I'm sure you would do it without a hesitation. You know, and that's awesome. Absolutely. Um, Thank you. Know, you. Appreciate it. Leaders like you were born. They're not made. You just have it or you don't. Um, there's there's a few oh. who just have it and, and some who don't. And uh, I, I know that you you will do everything that is expected of you uh, just because you as a person uh, won't allow people who look up to you to be disappointed. Uh, and that's that there's, there's the honor in all of that in, in who you are and, and the way you've chosen to lead. So again, um, check out the book house to house, uh, the documentary again, what was the name of the documentary you said that was on the, uh, it's on called HBO? only, only the dead. It's on Netflix, Netflix. Sorry. Um, check it all out guys. Just because again, you know, David, uh, his story uh, is is his, but, you know, there's a lot of other ways that you can do it. And you start to get some of the other background and context for all the people that were with you. And, and we can't forget about those folks either um, because you. it's your award. It's theirs, too. So from that standpoint, uh, the more light we can bring to the story and the people involved in it, um, the more notoriety everybody gets for it. But again, uh, humbly, thank you for the kind words. Certainly appreciate you joining us. And David Bellavia, thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground. Thank you for your service, man. Appreciate what you do. God bless. You've been listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.